Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel and welcome to another old Hollywood crime. This is the third video in this series and if you have not seen the other two, this is a series I am doing in partnership with TNT to promote their new show, I Am The Night. The series premieres on TNT on January 28th and you're definitely gonna wanna see this one because it is directed by Patty Jenkins who is the director of Wonder Woman. So she has worked with Chris Pine who's also in it and she's worked with him before. And the show is inspired by a true and incredible story of Fauna Hodel who is played by India Isley. The show uncovers some of the biggest, darkest secrets in one of Hollywood's most infamous murders, the Black Dahlia. And what's really exciting is by the time you guys are watching this, I'm likely in LA to actually go visit the Soudan House, which is where most of the show was filmed. The Soudan House has been a huge source of mystery since its construction in 1926. In 1945, it became home to Dr. George Hodel who is a character in Eye in the Night, and he was known for his notorious parties. This show's gonna be awesome. It looks so good. I'm really, really excited for it to come out, and I'm so excited to actually get to go to the Soudan house and see it in person. So if you haven't seen the trailer, I will link it below for you guys. Definitely check that out, and mark your calendars for January 28th for the premiere of I Am the Night. Now let's get into our old Hollywood crime for today. We are talking about Sal Mieno. Now, Salvatore Mieno Jr. was born on January 10th in 1939. So chances are a lot of you have not heard of him, but he was born in the Bronx. His mother enrolled him in dancing and acting school at a very early age. He was extremely warm, talented, funny, and smart, and he was said to be very sweet and gentle as well. In 1951, he had his first stage appearance in Tennessee Williams' play, The Rose Tattoo. He also played in the stage musical, The King and I. And on May 8th of 1954, he was in NBC's opera called Salome. As a teenager, he appeared in ABC's musical quiz program, Jukebox Jury. He made several television appearances before making his screen debut in Joseph Penvey's film, Six Bridges to Cross in 1955. He also was in a movie called The Private War of Major Benson in 1955. And his major breakthrough was when he was actually in the movie Rebel Without a Cause in 1955. He played John Plato Crawford, and his performance resulted in an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor, and his popularity soon developed from there. By the late 1950s, Sal was a major celebrity. He was actually sometimes referred to as the Switchblade Kid, which was a nickname that he earned from his role in the criminal movie called Crime in the Streets. His family actually moved to Mama Ronick from the Bronx in 1956, and Sal actually bought a $200,000 home for his parents in the Edgewater Point section. In 1957, he briefly got into the musical world and recorded a handful of songs on an album. Two of his singles reached the top 40 in the United States Billboard Top 100, so that was quite an accomplishment for him. And the more popular of the two, which was called Start Movin' In My Direction, was number nine on the Billboard chart, so it did really well. It sold over a million copies and was awarded a gold disc. Then later on, he starred as drummer Gene Krupa in the movie The Gene Krupa story in 1959. In 1960, he was cast in the film Exodus, which was an American epic film about the founding of the modern state of Israel. And when he was on set, he met another actor named Jill Haworth. The two of them became really good friends and kind of ended up in this on and off relationship for two years. They actually got engaged, but eventually he found out that Jill was actually cheating on him. She specifically had an affair with Bobby Sherman, and he was a singer at the time, but the two of them still remained friends after this, but he did call off the engagement. Sal ended up winning a Golden Globe Award and received a Academy Award nomination and Best Supporting Actor for his performance in Exodus. So. As you can see, life was going pretty good for him and he was pretty successful. But by the early 60s, his career sort of started to decline. He was becoming too old to play any of the roles that he used to play that is normally what he's comfortable with, you know, kind of like the young troubled teenager thing. But he was really depressed. He was really upset that no one seemed to want him anymore in anything and he was having trouble getting work. And that's just gotta suck when you've been coming off such a high. Even though he was struggling to get as many roles as he was used to or as big of roles as he was used to. He did get a role in The Greatest Story Ever Told in 1965, and he also appeared in season two of The Patty Duke Show, Patty Meets a Celebrity in 1964. 
And in 1965, Sal was in the movie Who Killed Teddy Bear? And he played the character of a stalker. And because of this, he was typecast as a sketchy criminal. So he couldn't break out of this role that, you know, people saw him as kind of like this bad boy, dark character. And he didn't really enjoy doing those roles that much. In 1969, Sal actually directed a Los Angeles production of the LGBT themed play, Fortune and Men's Eyes. And overall, the play did pretty good. Sal's last major movie role was a small part in the film Escape from Planet of the Apes in 1971 and he played a chimpanzee named Dr. Milo. When he was working on Fortune in a Men's Eyes, he actually met an actor named Courtney Burr who was a male. I know Courtney is a female name normally, but they became pretty close pretty quick. In 1973, he decided that he kind of wanted to be a producer and he ended up making a play called The Children's Mass. And the play was actually about a hooker, a transvestite as they were called at the time, a physically disabled writer and an alcoholic. So this was really pushing the boundaries. Like he had to get a lot of fundraising, crowdsourcing to get this thing going because it was so controversial for the 70s. In 1975, he played a small role on Hawaii Five-0. And then later on that year, he ended up getting cast in a play called P.S. Your Cat Is Dead. And he played a sketchy kind of burglar role. So by 1976, he was kind of starting to regain some of his success and things were looking good for him He was feeling a lot more comfortable and happy with where he was but then on February 12th of 1976 Sal was headed home after a rehearsal of PS your cat is dead And so he was walking to his apartment and pretty close to his apartment. There was an alleyway He lived off of the Sunset Strip in West Hollywood And this is when someone jumped out of the alley somewhere hiding and stabbed him and there was actually a woman with him when he died. Now he was only stabbed once, but he was stabbed in the heart and it was fatal. He died before paramedics even showed up at age 37. He was buried at the Gate of Heaven Cemetery in Hawthorne, New York on February 17th. And about 250 people gathered into the Holy Trinity Roman Catholic Church and dozens stood outside. Tons of his friends flew in for his services and Jill also attended the funeral. Now it didn't take long after he died for rumors to start going around about what happened to him and who killed him because there was no suspects. So when there's not a lot of answers and there's a really high profile case that people want answers for, normally the news kicks into their BS mode. And that's that's what they did here. They made your major like smear job of him. They were hinting stuff that like maybe because he was gay, he was in a bad relationship and was killed by a boyfriend, like just making all these weird excuses. People thought that maybe he was messing around with male prostitutes and got himself into some type of dangerous situation with drugs even. There's no proof that he did anything with prostitutes, but there was a club that they assumed he went to a gay club. And so they even went as far as to go under undercover and go in there and try to like antagonize people and they even tried hypnotizing people to try to figure out what happened. So for a year after he was killed, police came up with absolutely nothing. They had no idea who killed him. But one thing that police did do pretty shortly after the murder was interview a pizza delivery man named Lionel, who was actually in prison, who was currently in prison. He was in jail for robbery and he went to the police and just said, I have some information that can help you figure out who killed Sal. Apparently he claims that Sal got into some type of trouble with drugs. Around April or May of 1977, the police were actually contacted by another prison in Michigan where Lionel was currently being held at. And one of the prison guards said that he overheard Lionel talking about how he killed Sal. And then even Lionel's wife came forward and confessed to police that she believes her husband had something to do with the killing of Sal. And her reasoning for that is because the night that he was murdered, her husband Lionel came home covered in blood. So in January of 1979, Lionel was put on trial. And there were several things that pointed to Lionel being the killer. First of all, they were able to prove that Lionel had committed a robbery only half a mile from where Sal was killed within 30 minutes of Sal being murdered. There was also a car seen leaving the murder scene. The killer ran down the alleyway, hopped in this yellow car, and took off. And when asked about this, Lionel admitted that he was driving a yellow rental car at the time. Lionel also had a tattoo of the same knife that was used in the killing on his arm. So it seems pretty obvious that Lionel killed Sal. However, there was one major discrepancy that kind of threw everyone off, and that was that the guy who was reported to have killed Sal, eyewitness statements said that he had long brownish 
blonde hair, and Lionel had an afro. However, police were able to find an old photo of Lionel with his hair straightened, and apparently he had styled it like that sometimes, and it did look like what the witnesses described after they did that. So a few months later, in March, Lionel was found guilty for killing Sal and for 10 other robberies. However, just after 11 years of serving his time, he was paroled and set free in 1990. But it didn't take long until he was arrested again for robbery and homicide. He also was carrying around a fake ID with him, going under the name Raymond Williams. And he said that he was trying to change his name because he was dealing with shit for people thinking that he killed Sal, and he didn't want to be known as the guy who killed Sal forever. So super, super bizarre. It's really sad because Sal sounds like he could have done a lot more, and who knows what kind of films he would have been in or like how he would have changed the industry. And it's just so senseless. It's like, why? So it's one of those cases that's just really frustrating. But I really hope you guys found these Hollywood murders and crimes to be interesting. I know some of them are older and don't have as much information, but I find older crimes very, very interesting. But that's it for me today, guys. Be sure to check out I Am The Night on January 28th. It's going to be awesome. Mark your calendar. And I will see you guys next time.